Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Hall. Reed should be joining us here any second, and the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. We are rejoined from the Washington Post, Mr. Sam Forty. Thank you so much for blessing us on this beautiful Thursday evening, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm going to give a shout out real quick uh, to my younger sister, Sarah. She is graduating from the University of Missouri oh, in two weeks. I'm nice. going to be out there. I, I'm, a, I'm not going to be at rookie mini camp. I'm going to be there instead uh, supporting her. So uh, just a quick shout out to her. I think Ron Rivera would sign off on that one. Uh, Sam, <laughs> honest with you. But speaking of the commanders, you just came out with a new article today from the Washington Post talking about new ownership and the possibility of going back to RFK. So if you can, for us simpletons that don't know how to read, please explain to us what your article is about. <laughs> well, so there's actually two articles today. Um, one from my colleagues, Mark and Nikki, talking about two new owner, you know, ownership limited partners that are joining the Harris group. Um, and so that that is a good article from them you should absolutely read. The, the one that I wrote is basically um, there's a lot of legislative like hoops that we could talk about here, but the TLDR is basically that the commanders are on Capitol Hill meeting with the committees that would oversee a transfer or, or, or a lease extension modification that would basically allow the government, the DC government to get control of the RFK from the federal government and which would pave the way for Washington, the commanders to come back to RFK Stadium. Um, obviously, DC not controlling that land has been the biggest hurdle um, the entire time. And so, with the name change, with the ownership change, the mayor has said, you know, we are optimistic that this this can happen. Nice, nice. <clears throat> um, yeah, definitely good to hear that. We definitely love the stadium back in DC. For someone that's in his mid 30s and never experienced that, would definitely be a Definitely be something that would be cool. But um, jumping back to the draft, obviously the draft just happened. We, we took Emmanuel Forbes at 16, but uh, I think it was uh, Mike, Mike Mike Jones from The Athletic say, put out there that he had rumblings that um, Washington was possibly trying to trade up to number seven for Anthony Richardson. Me and Kyle were just kind of going back and forth about that when you got on. So uh, just did you hear any rumblings about that? And what did you what were your thoughts on that? You know, I, I think that I, I had heard that some people in, in the organization liked Anthony Richardson, but I hadn't heard that there was a plan in place to, to go up to number seven. Um, I still think that it, it would have been difficult for Washington to take a quarterback this year because I just don't think – even Anthony Richardson for all his athletic talents and, and his incredible ceiling that I think everybody sees – it's still not going to help Ron Rivera's regime win more games in 2023 in most likelihood. You know, I think Jacoby Brissett and Sam Howell are further along. They're going to be better quarterbacks in year one than, than Anthony Richardson will in all likelihood. And so when you talk about Ron needing to win as many games this year as possible to keep his job, to fight for his job, I just never saw quarterback any of these guys, unless it were Bryce Young or CJ Stroud slipping, which obviously we saw they didn't. Um, I'd be hard pressed to, to think that that was, one of their big plans. All right. You say that again for Hall, just in case he didn't hear you. I'm just <laughs> no, but uh, I, I want to ask you about Emmanuel Forbes, Sam, and, uh, and Jartavius Martin. Um, if you haven't already, I know we've all talked about those two, all acknowledging already, but kind of give your input on those two uh, draft picks. Have you heard any cool things about them on the side or anything? And then also, what do you think happens with that cornerback room now? What do you think happens with Kendall? Because a lot of people have speculated Kendall could be cut, I think that he's better served on this roster than not. All right. There's like four questions in yeah. there. So yeah. I'll try to, I'll, <laughs> I'll try to break them down one by one. Uh, Emmanuel Forbes. Let, let's start with him in the first round pick. I think the easiest thing to say is that Washington really struggled to generate turnovers last year. Um, I think they had nine and 16 games, which was fifth worst in the league. And so how do you address that? What is the most direct way you can address it? You say, all right, we're going to go get the best ball hawking corner in the draft. And this is a guy that had 14 picks. Everybody knows 14 picks. He had, you know, six pick sixes, which was an MVS record. And he's really good. Um, and he played in the SEC, which really matters to this regime. Like Ron Rivera values that a lot, as we've seen, you know, um, through, through all his drafts. Um, 
And I think that they really like him as a player. The question that I have, obviously, that a lot of people have is about his weight. He weighed in at 166 pounds for the combine. Um, in the in, in, Since at least 2000, there's only been one corner drafted who's lighter than that. A guy named Lamont Brightful in 2002 played a couple years in the league. But it's just there are not a lot of corners who are sub 170. And let's say, you know, he shows up to camp and the team is like, oh, he's, he's actually 180 now. Like there's still just not a lot of corners like lighter than 175 who have played a lot of snaps in this league. And so you, you watch the tape and you see the effort and you see the willing tackler and you see all this stuff. Um, and, and that's real. And, you know, when we met him on Friday after the draft, he, he you, it's hard not to notice. I mean, he's a thin guy and I'm not saying that he won't succeed, but I'm saying the commanders are betting on a body type that uh, has not a lot of precedent for success at his position. Yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. I, I, oh, yeah, I, have, like, to, I have to go. There was like three more questions. Things. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I just, uh, I feel like I'm rambling. So I hate, I hate to do this, but uh, okay. I love, it. I love it, Sam. Keep going. The thing, the thing that uh, Jartavius Martin, number one thing, he's been called Jartavius Martin. He's been called Quan Martin throughout this whole process. And they've been using it interchangeably. We asked him what he prefers. He says he prefers Quan Martin, which okay. is his middle name. So that is a, a good note for, for everybody. So Quan Martin really like, I didn't like, I, I read it in the scouting reports that he was versatile. And then I started watching the Illinois tape and it's like, this dude is just bouncing from nickel to like single high and cover one. Like, and he's, and he's rotating outside. Like he can do everything. And it, and it makes a lot of sense for this team. Um, particularly, you know, how they like to play, you know, disguise their coverages um, with the Buffalo nickel. I don't know if he's big enough for that. I think he could be. Um, but if he's, you know, there with Defoe and, and Cam Curl, I wonder if either Defoe or Cam are the Buffalo and, and he's maybe more up top. But I will say that, like, the way he fits into the Washington scheme is actually really interesting because at Illinois, the D.C. loved playing, like, the five down lineman front, the penny front. He would play that and then he would play, like, cover one behind it like an insane amount i want to say like 55 percent of the time and so like if you come in here and jack del rio like that's what he wants to do he wants to play his five down lineman in, in rushing situations and he wants to trust his defensive back end and like Quan fits into that uh that philosophy for sure all right let me take a deep breath part three <laughs> is kendall fuller how does he fit into this I think that Kendall Fuller, like you said, Kyle, like he fits into this roster. I think that there's still a better team with him than without him. And it's a good problem to have that you now have like five defensive backs where you got to figure out where they play. Right. right. Like that's, you know, that that's a, that's what you want. Um, he is older. He does play well in zone. And I do wonder, like, if they start to think, OK, Emmanuel can only play outside because of his frame. He is not playing in the slot. He didn't play the slot in college. He's not playing the slot in the NFL. He has to be outside. And so it's all right. Do we do we like Kendall outside? Do we want to put BSJ back inside as well? Like how how does that work? And I think that they're probably going to figure that out on the field in OTAs or in camp. But I I wonder, you know, if they do get to a point where they decide like, hey, maybe we like BSJ and his length outside better. Does that make Kendall expendable, or do you keep him as a you know as a veteran? But Basically, like they only have two and a half million in cap room and they need to create more to sign their rookie class. And Kendall is basically in the same position financially as Chase Rulier, the center. If you cut them, uh, if you cut either of them, you basically take on about three and a half million dead cap and you save eight, a little bit more than eight million dollars in, uh, in cap savings. So Chase Rulier, I think uh it, it makes sense for them to either cut him or to restructure his deal. I think one of those things is going to happen with Kendall. If they need the cash, if they feel really good about Quan Martin, or if they feel really good about Emmanuel Forbes in that defensive backs room, maybe that's something they consider, but I see him as way less likely um, right now, at least than that happening to chase really a. Mm. Right. Right. So does that, does that make sense? We, we covered all. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Reed's not here. Yeah. So I have to ask you his questions too. That's why. Oh, okay, okay, I got you. <laughs> Sticking with the draft, um, I, I know a lot of people, once J.D. McKissick um, was – did he retire or was he cut? I can't remember. But he was long, cut. whenever – cut, yeah, when he was cut, um, a lot of people kind of shifted to – and then obviously when Eric Bieniemy was hired, that, that running back was going to be a need for this team, kind of that third down, kind of scat back guy. They ended up drafting Chris Rodriguez in the sixth round, who's kind of a bigger thumper, bruiser type like Brian Robinson. So my question is, how do you think – is that a confidence uh, confidence builder as far – or a confidence, I guess, builder for Antonio Gibson as far as 
he can kind of be that scat back guy in open space. And what do you think the role for Brian Robinson in the running back room and Chris Rodriguez is going to be going forward? Yeah, so to me, you draft Chris Rodriguez, who is way more Brian Robinson than he is Antonio Gibson. If you go back and look at his college stats, it's something like he had something like 580 carries in his career and he had 20 catches. Like that tells you all you need to know about that guy. He's a good downhill physical runner, um, bring some of that edge that that they had, you know, they like about Brian. And, and they had a third round grade on him, according to my colleague, Nikki Javal. So obviously Eric Bien liked this guy a lot. Um, the, you know, I got this argument the other day with, with somebody with the team where it was like, Oh, everybody wants to shift Antonio away from, you know, away from having uh, away from running downhill. Cause they don't think he's good at it. I think he's really good at it. And, and what I said to that is I don't think that he's bad at like running downhill. And you look at that four game win streak in 2021 when he sealed that bucks game with that crazy drive at the end, like there is no hate for me on like what that dude can do between the tackles downhill. But the play that I keep going back to is like the Buffalo screen when he housed yes. it from like 76 Thank you. yards. Yes. Like when you have that level of explosiveness and elusiveness and you can be a game changer in space, like why, why not let Brian and Chris like run those power inside the zone duo, like, and then just be like, Hey, Antonio, like we're going to figure out how to give you the ball in space. And like, we're going to let you do what you do best. Like let that man cook. Um, please, please. So, so like, that's to me, I, I see Antonio taking over the JD role and I, and I think he's going to be good at it. Absolutely. Now to wrap this up, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you. But in the third round, they drafted Ricky Stromberg, who won the Brooks Award in the SEC, the best blocking offensive lineman in the SEC last year. Is he going to be playing center or guard and kind of like corner with Kendall Fuller? This kind of is like throwing spaghetti at the wall, so to speak, getting a lot of options there. What do you think happens to Stromberg? Do you find, see him starting at center? And what goes on with everywhere, everywhere else? Okay, really good question. I think the offensive line right now, we, we're pretty confident that Charles Leno will be the left tackle. Andrew Wiley will be the right tackle, right? And the interior is the thing that we don't know about, those three spots. And it is really important, and it was highlighted by some breaking news right before we jumped on. The Giants signed Dexter Lawrence to basically the same deal as Deron Payne. But it's really a good reminder. And, like, the Eagles drafting Jalen Carter at number nine, like, those are really good reminders that, like, Washington has to figure out the interior offensive line. It's not like the sexiest topic. Like right. it's not something that I get to talk about a lot, but like it's going to be key. Cause last year you bet on two older unathletic guards in Norwell and Trey Turner. And like that hurt you. Like you weren't able to run some of the same concepts, especially, you know, outside zone and have some of those pullers that you did the year before. So it's really important for them to figure this out. And I think that Braden Daniels, the fourth round pick from Utah, Ron said he expects him to be more of a tackle. And, you know, we asked him uh, after the last day of the draft, I believe, like, do you think that Nick Gates could slide over and play guard? Because remember, they told him that he would be a center when they signed. Right. And Ron, Ron kind of shook his head. No. So what I expect, unless, you know, there's always competition in camp, things could always change. But as of right now, I expect Nick Gates to be the center. I think that that's what mm -hmm. they plan on. So that leaves – a bunch of different guys for the two guard spots. I think Sam Cosme, particularly because he's second round pick, he's going to get one of them. So you have that open competition and you have Ricky Stromberg, Sadiq Charles, and Chris Paul. Those are the three names. Am I forgetting anybody? Larson as well. But I, I think Larson as a veteran is, is going to be a backup center because they wanted to get younger at center. I got you. Um, and he, he does not have guard flexibility. He, he's only played center. So I would say those three guys will compete for that left guard spot. And like – you know, the. I think that to me, there is an argument to be made that what Washington has done so far this season on the interior offensive line is more quantity than quality. But that said, if one of those three bets pays off, you know, if they say if Strongberg comes in and balls, if Sadiq Charles can put it all together, because I do think he's a really he has a lot of potential as an athletic player. Um, and if Chris Paul, you know, builds on, I thought what was a, a decent Dallas game then you have like theoretically a good option. And, and particularly if you have a, an injury inside, you know, it's not going to be as devastating as Chase Rullier was, um, you know, in last year, or the two years before. So that's sort of what the offensive line looks like at this moment. It could always change, but that's what I see right now. Wow. Great stuff, dude. I really do appreciate it. Next question I have for you very simply, Sam, after this draft class, the undrafted free agent class, they still have a little bit of moves to go, but did Washington get better? 
Yes, they did get better because they added depth and talent at, I think, a, a position group defensive back that they really needed. I think that they can you know, execute um, some different coverage schemes, some different disguises um, in a way that, that I think is an upgrade. I think, you know, like Quan Martin and Emmanuel Forbes are an upgrade over over Bobby McCain, which is really like the, the one guy that you lost. Um, right. So I think they got better. I think they targeted a lot of guys like they did last year, right? You know, guys with extensive play histories in either the Big Ten or the SEC, guys that are expected to come in and play right away. They might not have the highest ceilings, but they do have high floors. You are very confident, like, when Ricky Stromberg steps on that field, I know what this is going to look like. There's not a lot of projection there in the same way that there was with Antonio Gibson or Benjamin St. Juice or Jamin Davis. So, to me, they got better. Um, how much better is an open question, but, you know, I, that's always true after the draft. <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> Last one I have for you. Today's May the 4th. So, you know, May the 4th be with you. I'm not sure if you're a Star Wars fan or not, Sam, but do you have a favorite Star Wars uh, movie? I, of course I'm a Star Wars fan. My dad's a big Star Trek guy, big there space guy. Uh, my mom was the one that got Elon me into guy. sports more. <laughs> no, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just I'm kidding. All that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I remember like going to see Attack on the Clones in the movie theater and, like, uh, when I was younger – and and it was that was not my favorite one, but like I would say I would say probably episode four to me was like my favorite because it was like the thing that I remember like you know it was one of the first movies I watched with my dad and like we always had like you know we would always go back and forth and um, you know it was just it's just a, a great movie so uh, I, I would probably say episode four. My man, it's a it's a good one. I mean, it's a touchy subject for Star Wars fans. They get very upset whenever you talk about this subject. <laughs> but I do appreciate you as always, Sam. I know you got something to do, but I do uh, everything that you gave us today was really good insight. And I do appreciate your time as always, brother. Yeah, of course. I'm not going to give Grant and Danny anything. Don't worry. I right, appreciate it, Sam. Nice, You're the best, nice. brother. We'll see you again <laughs> next it. time, man. Enjoy your weekend. Appreciate it, y'all. Have a good one. All right, Sam. And that was great to talk with Sam Fortier of the Washington Post. Always good to talk yeah. to him, man. Yes, sir. I like that he gave his uh, updated line 2.0, uh, what it's going to look like like he's going into camp. So, uh, yeah, like you said, always uh, breaks it down pretty good for us, what's going on on the inside of Commander's Nation. Yeah, and the one thing I am surprised by was that him picking Gates to be the center. I know that what Ron Rivera has said and everything like that, but – you know, looking back at their third rounders, typically they're playing and they're playing immediately, uh, barring Brian Robinson, who got shot, of course. But, you know, Antonio right. Gibson played. Um, and then obviously this year with Ricky Stromberg, I just don't find that to be, I don't know, plausible. Like, I feel like you do want to put your best five out there. But obviously I respect Sam. Maybe he's one of the best five come camp. Maybe he's one of the best five and they slot him at left guard. Yeah, so. uh, I think the smarts is probably the biggest thing about that because Ruye is one intelligent kid. When you put him on the field, you feel confident he's going to put everyone in position. That's probably exhibit number one and making sure. But secondly, it's consistency. Can we just get the same five out there for like 10 yeah. games at least? You know what I'm saying? Right. But now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Scott Hartley in the UK. Oi! How you doing, brother? Oi! Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, gents. Thanks for having me on, as always. Um, really appreciate you reaching out. Um, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm back off Eastern Standard Time now after the draft. So, um, yeah, all, all good from my end. Um, really interested in this draft class that we've picked up and some of the UDAs that we've picked up, too. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's inching closer to football season and um, getting back out for that uh, home opener. So, yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Yeah, we got it. We had to go international for this, Scott. Yeah, I got it. You being from the one point safety show that you host with Andy Lockhart that people could go find on YouTube, uh, go and search the one point safety show. You can find Andy and Scott here. But I wanted to get your opinion over in the UK, boys. How are you guys feeling about this draft class? Yeah, I think um, I don't like draft grades. I'll be honest with you, Kyle. Um, I don't care I'm about a draft in... grade. Just what do you think? No, nah, uh, it was good for what we for what we got. I think we we had holes at corner. We've got two DBs. Um, we've got, we upgraded on what was Bobby McCain with um, yeah, Quan Martin. And um, yeah, we have, man. And then obviously double dipping into the, um, double dipping into the um, offensive line twice. You know, that's, that's good. And it was, it's one of them where we, we look at this and we say, we needed depth. We've picked up depth and it's positions of need have been filled. So I'm quite comfortable where we, where we are with that. Um, everybody's board's different. Um, we're, we're all couch GMs. Um, there were players that I wanted 
that weren't selected, but that's just me. You know, it's it's always going to be like that. And that's a perfect segue, Scott. That's exactly what I was going to ask you about. What was there a pick? You have to be honest with us now. Was there a pick mm -hmm. that when it was made at first glance, you were like, man, but then it grew on you and you're like, actually, I really like this. Emmanuel Forbes. Um, I wanted Gonzalez yeah. straight away. Um, if you can, you can go back and you can watch my reaction on um, the Bleeding Burgundy pod that I joined them at 3 a.m. live when we, uh, we Vampire, had the live review. I watched, I, I watched you guys as well. And I think the, the buzz was the same with me and you, Kyle. We're both like initially like, what? He was there? But I think it's really made name recognition. I went back and watched your breakdown and watched a bit more tape. Um, and, it, and it convinced me that on day two. Um, Quan Martin, maybe a little high. I possibly could have thought that maybe Brown Branch went two places before us, two picks before. Not you're going to go all well. out. Yeah, you're, you're going to go <laughs> out all out. <laughs> maybe you uh, maybe you, you, you trade up and you, you, you take your guy there. I mean, there were two nickels or big nickels, whatever you want to call them in this draft. One was Quan Martin and the other one was Brian Branch. And, you know, I think if you're going to go there, that's where you'd be aggressive. I don't want to hear the coaching staff and the GM afterwards saying we should have been more aggressive. But yeah. Obviously I'm happy with what they picked up. So. Yeah, dude, because, you know, I heard a lot about Brian Branch and look, he was a very big playmaker for Alabama, but I feel like that Illinois defense was even more of playmaking ability than the Alabama defense was in Brian Branch. And Quan Martin had a lot to do with that. I was very surprised with his playmaking ability. I, I've talked a lot about his explosiveness, right? The 11-1 broad jump, uh, mm -hmm. the 44-inch vertical. Th that explosion shows off, but also being the leader on the field, I kind of talked about that Cam Curl aspect of it. And I, at first, I was kind of like, what? But then when I watched the tape and I watched him, and it's like you're kind of getting a complete football player. Like you're getting a kind yeah. of leader grown up of that defense that was one of the mo most playmaking defenses in college football last season. Two other draft picks that were high up. I think this kid is what's being pushed by the wayside is playmaking ability. And I think that he's a lot better than he, what he's getting credit for at the moment. But guys, to wrap up this episode, I want to get your guys' fan questions. I want to ask your opinion on this because this one was sent by the Colonel. And it's a really good question. So Scott, I'm going to start it with you, brother. He says, my shock and horror at our initial draft picks has subsided, and I'm actually thrilled with most of our selections, most especially with Forbes' potential, but also the things we didn't do. We didn't go for a tight end. We didn't go for a developmental quarterback. Way to go, Ron, Eric, and Jack. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I'm exactly the same boat as you are, Colonel. I look back um, at some of the tape. I look back at the picks thereafter. You know, you go right through this draft and you look through, you think Stromberg could be a starting centre in the future, not necessarily right now. But again, he had a higher vertical jump than Keely Ringo. So the athleticism's there. Some questions about how he anchors down on the line. And then we go back to like Braden Daniels, you know, is a potential there. They're going to start him at tackle, potentially kick him inside if it doesn't work to guard. Um KJ Henry, really good pick. You know what I mean? You, you, you don't play at Clemson for nothing. You know, it's a good college. It's a good school. And then we're down to like Chris Rodriguez Jr. You no, know? initially, again, I was a little bit like, why have we picked up another bruising Don't talk back? about him yet. Don't talk about him yet. That's the Colonel's okay, next man. question. Okay, man. Yeah, you're okay. good. I know, Scott. Yeah, you're I agree. excited, Scott. You're excited. But I agree. And I agree. <laughs> it was, I, went, I went through it and thought, yeah, I'm, I'm quite comfortable where we are now with these picks. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy, man. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Colonel. Um, I am very happy they didn't go for a tight end. I'm very happy that they didn't trade up for Anthony Richardson um, and others. I will say that they did a very good job. Like, Because I said I failed you guys before because I felt like I did not see this draft class the way it was supposed to be and what their vision was. But now looking back at it, I think that it was awesome with what they did. And I, I'm so glad they didn't go get a quarterback or anything like that. That's the last thing you want to do for Sam Howell right now and just bring up more questions that, that need to be right now. And, look, I know you want to get better. You want to have put the best guys out there, especially with the quarterback position. I get it. I just don't I, I don't have the stock in Anthony, Anthony Richardson as everybody else does. Um, I think the trend of the NFL, we're coming back around to the whole, uh, you know, quarterbacks are developmental we kind of should chill out on it and stop taking them at top five because you're gonna be drafted quarterback in a couple years anyway yeah um like you guys said uh only uh i guess i guess the big shocker everyone for the most part was everything when they took emmanuel forbes over christian gonzalez but like uh like everyone's been laying out before 
with a team that ranked bottom five in turnovers last year, you got a guy that hopefully is going to come into the NFL and do what he's been doing since high school, which is generating turnovers and getting the ball back for the offense, flipping the field for the offense, which, again, goes into helping a younger quarterback who, again, I go back to the Dallas game last year, week 18. Everyone's so impressed with Sam Howell, but the reason people were so impressed was they were getting turnovers on defense. They were getting turnovers on the special team. They were flipping the field, making it easy for Sam Howell to go 20, 30, 40 yards down the field, put him in field position, put him in score position. So um, if you look at it that way, then you you start to realize, okay, I see the vision. And like we just talked with Sam about, it's a typical Ron Rivera, Martin, Mayhew, uh, Marty Herney draft where it's not going to be a guys that have like a a very high uh, ceiling, but it's going to be guys that have a lot of experience in college that are three, four year starters have played hundreds of snaps in, in college, played in the toughest divisions of college football in the Big Ten and the SEC, and they're going to come in, they're going to be starters and or contributors right away, at least the co- first couple round guys. They're going to be starters, contributors right away, and they're going to be guys that can help, like I said, right away, week one or somewhere in between the middle of the season. So when you just look at the whole total totality of it, would I have been mad if they went tight in at 47? No, because a guy with – Again, with a young quarterback, a tight end, a young tight end that can eat up space, eat the middle of the middle of the field up is a quarter, young quarterback's best friend. And a t- again, the team that's been struggling to score touchdowns, especially in the red zone, a, a, a good tight end that can eat up space and knows how to work the middle of the field is a young QB's best friend. But again, I've been a proponent of I like what Logan Thomas coming back off the ACL. So, again, at the end of the day, like I said, I Self give rebuttal. it. No, no, yeah, because I like I said, I was telling everybody they were never going tight end. So, yep. like I said, I wouldn't have been mad at it, but I also know that I have faith that Logan Thomas is going to be not twenty twenty Logan Thomas, but somewhere around there coming back two years off the ACL now. Yeah, we need to like bring back some of these like national mock drafts. Like the dude picked Dalton Kincaid going in the first round. Not only did we not draft a tight end, we didn't even bring a tight end in in our undrafted free agents. Uh, just to right. say that, so kind of a ridiculous mock draft. But the I mean, look. The media all off season was like they want a quarterback. They don't believe in Sam Howe, and then obviously we believe in Sam Howe. They need tight ends. They need a young tight end. They kept saying we believe in our tight ends. So do is what they show you, not what this or do what they say, not what they show you, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> do like, as I say, not as I do. It's a joke that's, that's always it. said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're hysterical. You know man. what I meant. You know yeah. what I meant. Let's go to the next question, Scott. This is from the Colonel. I was going to ask you guys a question about the reports of us being interested enough to move up to number seven for Anthony Richardson. And the only reason we didn't was because he got taken at four. What do you think about those reports from Mike Jones? Um, I, I, I don't think there's anything in them. I think it's just media clicks. Um, I honestly couldn't see how we could go up to seven for Anthony Richardson. Um, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't think for, they'll have done their homework on him. And, and I think they genuinely did. They were interested in Hendon Hooker. I do think that was definite interest there. For Anthony Richardson, I don't think there is. I, I, I was more looking at him thinking he could potentially have bust written all over him. But, you know, we don't, we don't know. I'm, I'm glad we didn't go Will Levis as well. I, th- I think putting a quarterback at all just said there in the frame for Sam with Sam Howell, it would have shot his confidence big time. And I, I don't think that's what they want to do. And they're going to go with a young man, see how he rolls out. If we need a quarterback next year, we need a quarterback next year. But as you said, you look at the way this draft's been built, it's it's built around the trenches. It's built around making sure we fill holes that we need. And then going back to Hall's point again, you know, if you can shorten the fields, that's great. You know what I mean? That, that means that you, you've got a short field to work with for Sam Howell. So, for me, I don't think it's I don't think it was any interest in there at all. I think that's pure clickbait, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, uh, Hall and I were kind of arguing about this before we started recording. I don't believe it uh, at all. A uh, big reason why I do I think Mike Jones is plugged in with Washington. I find it hard to believe. Is it possible? Of course. So that would lend to believe that most likely got that info from the opposing GM right in Las Vegas that Washington was considering the trading up for Anthony Richardson. So, Hall, let's think about this in a fantasy football draft, so to speak. Let's say you're in front of me, two spots, and I reach out to you, and I say, hey, Hall, I'm trying to trade up with you, right? And you say to me, all right, well, who are you, who are you going to draft? Who are you trading up for? I'm going to say, I don't want to tell you, because what if you don't take my trade? Then you take the guy that I want. And that's my whole point about this, is where it makes zero sense whatsoever. Now, if the 
opposing GM had told Mike Jones that it was an offensive player, and Mike Jones is connecting the dots with Marty Herney and stuff, which made him land with Anthony Richardson at seven, then that makes plausible sense to me, that he's guessing that it's Anthony Richardson rather than doing that reporting, and that's why I asked Sam this earlier, to see if he had heard any lick of that. And uh, what I think happened is that they were... They might have been interested in trading up to seven for somebody like Darnell Wright because there might have been rumblings in Chicago. Ron has ties to Chicago that they might have liked Darnell Wright, and maybe that's why they wanted to move up there. Um, but I, I don't put any stock into it. I think it's kind of ridiculous, you know, because we they were thinking about moving up to seven for Anthony Richardson, but he went at four. So what's the whole point of reporting that? Yeah, it makes zero sense it, besides causing division between Sam Howell and the organization. And uh, I'm not really interested in doing that. Well, I do think there's like some validity to it because everyone, there was all the already rumblings that Marty Herney was really intrigued and he was kind of banging the table for Anthony Richardson. Like obviously was Marty Herney there? Yeah. Marty Herney was there when they drafted Cam Newton. And obviously everyone's talking about this is Cam Newton 2.0 as far as like just the athletic freak that Anthony Richardson is. So he's probably living, like, thinking back to, like, hey, this is how we had success in Carolina. Everyone obviously calls them the Commanders. Hold They're on. trying to bring the Carolina down here. All I'm but hold is, on, let me keep going. Uh, can I say one thing? All, All I'm right. going to say is if Marty Herney is the one that's pounding the damn table and if he's the one who brought Carson Wentz here, he should probably sit down and shut up. All I'm oh, going to yeah, say. Of course, of course, of course. But no, nah, Ron was the one that looked at the analytics. He said it himself. You banged the table for him. But now, nah, um, also, to your point, for them to trade up above – uh, Chicago for Darnell Wright. Yeah, I get that because obviously Ron's ties to uh, Chicago, but you're not giving up all that capital for a guy that they're probably more than likely we're going to plug in at right tackle to begin with. So I don't think they're ever going to jump up for him. I mean, you definitely could have played left tackle. It, but... it wouldn't have been that much. It's only seven. I mean, what Bill Belichick traded back from 14 to what, 17 and got a fourth rounder out of it. You know, it's not that expensive. Yeah, but they would have had to go from 16 up to nine. seven. That's like nine whole spots. Yeah. But anyway, so I, I, I don't think that like, I don't think that like the GM was like, hey, they like, like you said, when they called her, like, hey, we want Anthony Richardson. Like he didn't say this is the guy I want. I think they did say, like, after the fact, like, now that the draft is over, like, you're not going to tell them during the draft, this is the player that I want. Because, like you said, he's going to be like, well, now I know who you want. You're either going to give me more than what I'm asking for, or I'm just going to take your guy. So I think that it was one of those, like, calls that guys like Mike Jones, who, I mean, he's down, he used to work for, work for the Washington Post, so he knows, like, he's still close to people down here. He goes on one of six all the time and talks to those guys. But – I think that he was just making his like calls around the leagues, like, hey, what's your thoughts pre-draft? What did Washington do? What did you hear about Washington during the draft? And I think that someone brought up from, I guess, obviously Las Vegas's camp, like, hey, yeah. there was talks between us. Washington wanted to trade up. And, like, they told us after the draft, like, hey, this is the guy that we wanted, like, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. But, again, at the end of the day, there, there was never – he was never going to drop past, like, four or five anyway. And I would have been blown. I would have been pissed if they would have took Anthony Richardson because, like Sam said, he's like they need players that are going to be able to help them now. And unless you're going to just mold like a whole Lamar Jackson style offense around Anthony Richardson year one, which EB could probably do, it would have just been not really worth it. It would have been shades of like 2012 RG3 all over again. Really, really highs or a lot of really lows. So, end of the day, I do think there was some uh, validity to it, but it was never really going to happen just because he was never going to get down to seven anyway. It's a guess. Now, let's go to the next question. This <laughs> is from the Colonel again. Hall, I'm going to start. Sorry, no, Scott, because Hall just talked a lot. I got to give him a break. Chris Rodriguez Jr. was selected in the sixth round by the Commanders. He was projected as the fourth running back in this class, just behind Jameer Gibbs, and was supposed to go in the second or third round. He had some character issues with the DUI and a work-related time card miscalculation, resulting in a multi-game suspension. Was his slide attributed to these character issues, and is Ron the right guy to set him straight? Yeah, I think so. Um, this is this for me was the first pick of the EB era. Um, I looked at this and this looked like this was an EB guy. Um, obviously, Ron has come in. He's, he wants high character dudes. He wants people who are athletic freaks. He wants high RAS score, RAS score people in his building. And he's building that way. For me, I think this is a great value pick. This is probably one of my if not the best pick of our draft, in, in my opinion, for value, for pure value. It takes away the carries from Brian Robinson, who openly said, I was only playing at 80% most of the season. Clearly, 
there must be a bit of overlag from the um, injury that he suffered in the off season last year. And this keeps him fresh as well. And then I initially thought we may pick up someone like some sort of scat back type player later in the draft, but it's obvious now that EB kind of signaled that for Antonio Gibson. So if that's the way that he's going to go with it, what's better than having one big bruiser? It's two. So for me, yeah, it's a great pickup. You know what I mean? I think it's a really good pick. The character issues I'm not concerned about. People get DUIs. I understand, you know, people are young. Yeah, they do. It, it, you know, the, it, it happens in life. <laughs> I've never had one, mate, so there you go. I have but, um, Yeah, never, me either. Not never, going no, 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 no. Maybe I'm just too good. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, and he missed four games, didn't he, because of obviously the other um, issues around there. But that's easily fixed. And, you know, I mean, he's he, when EB gets hold of him, I think we'll see a decent player. I really do. Yeah, Hall's the only person alive who got a... <laughs> who got his car stolen and then tur- burned on, on fire for no apparent reason whatsoever. The craziest story I've ever heard in my life. I'll tell you many, many car, many, many car stories throughout my life. That's <laughs> so all, crazy. That'll be for the summertime when we got nothing else to talk about. Right. Um, and, Colonel, I do think that his the character issues is possibly what did make him slide, maybe something that Yeah, man, that's cool. Or just having it all together, right? Um, I do think that that is probably a big issue with teams when they're looking at it because they don't want, with everything going on with J- with Henry Ruggs, you know, with Jalen Carter. Last thing you want to do is kind of bring somebody in like that, and as a possibility being a, a problem. But I don't think it's Ron Rivera that's going to be able to set him straight. I think it's Eric Bieniemy because I think Eric Bieniemy went through something very similar early in his career, and that he knows. And recovered from that, and that's why he feels comfortable with that guy, so to speak, if that makes sense. And so that's why I think that he's a great fit here. And I think one of the biggest things is the fact how hard of a hitter he is. He's always falling forward, very tough physical runner, but he can he does have a little bit of speed to him. But he is that bulldozer, and he can break tackles just by running through guys, arm tackles and whatnot. And I think that's probably I said whatnot. I hate that word, and I'm sure that's why Eric Bieniemy likes him a lot is the broken arm tackles and everything, that physical mindset. And uh, more than anything, as a person, as a man, I think Eric Bieniemy is going to be able to tutor him more than anything else. I don't think about setting him straight, but I think about, you know, tutoring him. Yeah. Um, like, it's like going back to, again, like Ron's drafts, and he likes guys that are played a lot of snaps in the in, in, uh, in college, uh, a lot of starting experience, a lot of, uh, like I said, starts under their belt. And – High character guys, and I don't think that even if he was like a six round pick, and the, obviously the DUIs, the DUI I should say did uh, drop him a little bit in the draft. I do think that they did their homework on him, like you said. Eric Vandermy is going to be able to mold this guy, and Eric Vandermy is really high on him apparently, due to like the, the reporting that was done on him, and had like a high, really high like third or fourth round grade on him. So I definitely think that, like they said, he was sticking out like a sore thumb on their board, right. and. Like Scott said, I think that Eric Vandermeer was like really like, hey, go got, go get this guy. I have a specific – I have a plan for this guy. I think that he can contribute for us and be really good for this offense. And at the end of the day, like like we were talking about with Sam, and like Scott said, when you got a guy like Brian Robinson who is going to wear the defense down throughout the game, he gets expelled – he gets spelled. You bring a guy like Chris Rodriguez in who normally you take a guy like Brian Robinson out as a change of pace guy. You bring another guy like Chris, Rod- look, Chris Rodriguez – the, the defense is like, oh, man, I thought we were going to get a break with, like, a scat back, like, kind of a, a catcher yeah. out the backfield type of guy. Now we got another guy coming at us downhill again. Right. And then you add in a guy like Antonio Gibson, who I think I'm, I'm literally just, like, praying that this is his breakout season, like, going back to his rookie year where he's just a double-digit touchdown machine, yeah. catching the ball out the backfield, breaking 50, 60, 40-yard runs because, again, people forget his rookie season, he was breaking runs left and right on the team. So – I think that uh, the running back room with Eric Bieniemy being the offensive coordinator and a former running back, I do think that it's going to be a good season all around for the running backs. And he's a very a quality pass blocker as well. I think that's one of the biggest keys. Everyone was talking about Bijan Robinson, but with Bijan, his biggest weakness is pass blocking. And a yeah. lot of people will tell you, yeah, you could get better, but like the toughness of pass blocking, like you couldn't teach the. 
um, the want of Clinton Portis to come up and literally put everything into that blitzing linebacker, right? Like, that's something you're born with, and that's kind of what Chris Rodriguez has, um, so to speak. Uh, Scott, I know you're up late, brother. If you got to get out of here, you're more than... No, at all, man. I'm good, honestly. I'm you good. Sure? It's no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. All it's right. only... It's... 10.40. That's good for me. Man. Oh, okay, it's good. All right. I just Don't want to make sure. I know some time goes differently over there in the UK. I didn't know if it was like 5 a.m. or something. But no, let's... no it's, five, it's five hours ahead of you, uh, but yeah, it's cool. Our guy in the Discord, uh, Mr. Tony Shiver, sent us in his reaction to the draft class. So before we get into our Discord questions or our questions from Twitter, I just want to get Tony's thoughts on the draft class. Let's hear what Tony thinks. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is uh, Tony Shivers here. Uh, first off, I want to just thank everyone in the Discord, and Facebook, or whoever. Uh, that have reached out with support uh, as my wife is b- battling cancer. So I really appreciate that, guys. Um, now on uh, to my thoughts on the draft. Uh, overall, I'm cautiously os- optimistic. At first, some of the picks, you know, I was kind of like a head-scratcher type thing. But then when you take a step back and you look, you see why, for example, they went with Forbes over Gonzalez. I mean, other NFL teams did too. Everyone thought he was a locked top 10 pick. But you see Forbes penchant for turnovers, big plays in the SEC, whatnot. So you can see why there. Um, you also see we got an upgrade over Bobby McCain. We got some good uh, players for the interior of the O-line. Uh, the guy from Arkansas, maybe he'll start. Uh, we'll see how things go with camp and what they do with Rolier. And then we got um, uh, some other good picks later on. Um, at that point, I think it's kind of just like best player available that fits what you want to do. So, like the running back from Kentucky, I could see a scenario where he uh, rotates with Robinson as our main backs, and then they move AG into the McKissick or dynamic weapon type role. So, overall, you know, cautiously optimistic. We'll see how things go. But uh, we the team definitely did get better uh, over the draft. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. All the fuck out. Hey, thank you, Tone. And, you know, of course, we love you, brother. Uh, <laughs> everything you're going to, I'm glad that – Everything's going well with your wife at the moment. We're going to continue to pray for that, uh, Tony. Really do appreciate you, brother, and all your support yeah. for us. You know, we're always here for you. Everyone in the Washington and the 54th are here for you, brother. I really do appreciate your draft uh, stock. Now, this next one is from the first real OG, WCC Washington Command Center on YouTube, on Twitter. Dude's hilarious, besides his uh, <laughs> takes on Jackson Carmen. But that that being said, he, he said on Twitter, topic for tonight. How awesome Sam Howell is and help me start the movement to get him to change his number to 11. We had Campbell honor Doug, Dwayne, and Joe. Sam was taken just two picks higher than a most recent Super Bowl winning QB, and I think he should wear his number. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I like him in 14. I don't mind him wearing 11. Um, start the movement if that's what you want. Uh, I, I don't know who we, do we have. Who is 11 at the moment? Do we have an 11? No. On the team? No, we no. don't have well, the, if the number's available, maybe, but I'm not sure I'm not sure how that worked commercially for the team. And um, they obviously want to sell a lot of shirts. So um I don't know. But yeah, start that movement and we'll uh, we'll join and we'll see where it gets to. Yeah, I see what you're doing with Rippin. I, I get it, man. And it would be cool for him to wear eleven. I wore that for baseball and when I was playing in, in high school. I love the number eleven, but honestly, dude, I do not care, brother. He he could wear nine. <laughs> he could wear nine hundred and four. You know, I do not care. Just throw. Just be consistent. I think one of the biggest issues, like with Sam, like everyone keeps trying to project what he can do. And my biggest issue with all of this is like I love Sam. I think he's capable of reaching that. But my objective number one is first and foremost consistency and staying on the field. Can we have a starter be able to play in the first six weeks of the season without nearly breaking his leg in half? You know, like, can we just be get consistency first and then worry about what's being on yeah. top of that? Because I think that's the most important thing, first and foremost, is we need consistency on the offense. So so too many times we've been flipping guys around and moving stuff in. I just want to be able to supplement it, put it in, and send it uh, away. I'm just tired of it. But he could be 11. He could be 10. I don't know. I don't care. Appreciate you, OG. <laughs> You're the man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I mean, he can wear 14. He can wear 1,400. Like, I don't even care. Just go out there, throw 20, 25 plus touchdowns. What was 20 Sammy to 25 Ball, plus. Uh, uh, I think, I think so. so yeah. 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 He should wear 33. Let's do it. No, I think it's retired. Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm stupid. <laughs> I don't even think they can wear anything past like 
think the number 15 or something like that anyway. That's but, stupid. Yeah. How come quarterbacks are restricted, but the other positions aren't? Zero. Because you can't zero. have a quarterback wearing, like, number – that'd be weird, like, seeing a quarterback wear, like, number, like, 98 or something like, like that. Friday like, Night Lights, bro. Let's do it. No, nah, that's true. Ball. You don't know. Let Booby spin. Yeah. Nah, but, I mean, look, let, I don't I don't care what number he wears. Just go out there, like you said, be consistent. And he's been wearing four – I don't even know. Was he 14 in college? I, I can't even four, think back that far. Yeah, I can't seven. think back that far. I don't know. It's just oh, a number. No. Oh, no, no, he was seven. You're right, Scott. Seven? Yeah, yeah he was seven. He's seven. So, yeah, yeah. He's he's doubling up. He's trying to put double the uh double the uh work he put in in college. He's put in the NFL. So keep him at fourteen. Spent too much time talking about a jersey number. <laughs> now I, I'm just kidding, OG. I love you, man. This next question is from Twitter Razor Ramon. With Washington not taking a tight end in a loaded tight end draft, which one of our young tight ends do you all think that we will have that will have a breakout season, Scott? Yeah, um, Amani Rogers for me. He's he, he came on very well the first few games of the season, and dropped off a bit, and then I don't know if he was injured. Um, but yeah, Amani Rogers, I think he's going to have a, a, a massive season for me. Um, I, I even think he could be the one of the permanent starters there um, over Cole Turner. And um, obviously, we've got the blocking tight end in Bates. Bates needs to get his blocking back. Um, it was it was all pretty meh last season but obviously in his rookie season he was very very good and I'm really excited by Curtis Hodges as well you know the the tight end room for me is yes it's young it's very young and we do have that older veteran presence with Logan Thomas but again he's not been that long a tight end um but yeah I'm I'm excited by this and 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 that's why I didn't really want a tight end um if you picked up Zach Koontz that would have been awesome just for the jersey but you know it is it's what it is um (laughs) But yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not fussed at all that they didn't take a take a tight end. That's a, watch your potty mouth. This is a family Sorry. show, Scott. My yeah. goodness, <laughs> saying that K word. No, I I agree. <laughs> I think that Cole Turner is the pick if you're going with the young tight ends. He was injured last season. He was a red zone deep ball threat. I have a tweet for you from. Last year before the draft, about two weeks, I said, give me the jump ball tight end over a possession tight end. And I was talking about Cole Turner. That's who I wanted. They went and got him in the fifth round. He was a red zone jump ball guy. He was not good at blocking. And last season, that's where he was only used for the most part. And he was productive in that setting. That being said, being at 6'6", being that red zone jump ball ability, kind of having that athleticism with him with one year under his belt. I think Eric Bieniemy is going to be able to utilize Cole Turner in a sort of way that Travis Kelsey and other tight ends were in that system. I'm not saying that he will be t- Travis Kelsey or anything like that, but his frame, body type, athleticism, and his ability in the red zone, I think is what is going to make him have a really good year this year. I'm really looking forward to see Cole Turner. Yeah, um, honestly, I was going to go Cole Turner too, no, you but weren't. I was sitting here thinking about it just because like, if you go back to last year, training camp and whatnot – he was the talk of the town. He was the so he was the summer superstar. He was uh like you said, great in the red zone. Then he gets injured, then he comes back, gets injured again. So he never really got back on the field. And then when he did, like you said, it was just primarily blocking because the line was so bad you had to leave the tight end in the block. But as I was sitting here thinking about it when you guys were going, I'm gonna go with the uh, Armani Rogers and I'll put the slight edge over him. And that's because him being the former quarterback. And they had him in doing the jet sweeps and kind of the reverses last year. And he was getting active in the run game as well. So with those, like I said, the jet sweeps and the, the reverses. So with a, hopefully a creative mind like Eric Bieniemy, I think that uh, if Scott Turner can get him doing creative stuff like that, I'm just going to assume Eric Bieniemy is going to find a nice creative role and get him out in space and use his athletic ability to the offense's best ability for uh, this offense. Yep, and now let's go to our Discord for fan questions to wrap up this episode, Scott. Going to your co-host, the good-looking man himself, Mr. Andy Lockhart. Question for the pot. I keep seeing the disrespect the commanders are getting from the NFL and Dan Hunzis. I don't know what that is. Ranking us 30th after the draft. Why are we still getting this disrespect in the national media? Dan's gone soon. He's the guy that does, like, the NFL power rankings. So for NFL. Yeah, yeah, he does. Well, I'm Uh, stupid. I'm sorry. I think it's um we, we we talked about this before. I think it is a general disrespect because Danny is still around, and I think the national media wanted us to take a quarterback. 
And obviously, because we didn't address that, they then think, oh, well, they're going with basically a rookie. Sam Howell isn't a rookie. This is his second year. We need to take that away. And we need to say, right, he's not a potential second round draft pick anymore. EA came out in the fifth. That's gone now. But I think the disrespect is is still there. I mean, if we look at the over-unders and the totals that Vegas has put down, we've gone from seven and a half wins down to six and a half wins just from the draft. Uh, so we've dropped a win there straight away. Um, I don't believe that. I think this this is a loaded team in in a lot of areas. And I think we've, um, especially in the wide receivers, tight ends we've just spoke about there, and in the DBs as well, we've kind of completed what we needed in that DB room. So for me, yeah, there is a national disrespect, but that will change soon, but it's going to take time, maybe a year, maybe two years, um, and we'll be talking differently then. Uh, Andy, you cannot be surprised by this at this point, my brother. Uh, we've been joking about this. For years, I'm not going to say it's because of Dan. Like, I think that is kind of ridiculous. But let's kind of look at that in itself, right? Imagine an NFL person that's supposed to be educated in order of NFL teams or whatever. And the reason why they do not put or rank a team higher is because of their ownership. Um, not because of what they are in the field, what the coaches have been put in place, just specifically because of that. And just think about how much we should be weighing their opinions, right? Um, so let's take a step back a little bit. Let's calm down and know that, yes, you know that they're not the 30th ranked team. Who cares what Dan Henza says? He doesn't know. He's not out there. These are the same people that said Terry McLaurin was an elite wide receiver, some even in our own community. There were people saying that Cam Curl was not a top 10 safety in this league. Even some in our own community, he is. They were saying this wasn't a good defense last year. It was. Uh, it's always going to happen. Every ranking, every projection, that's what you're going to see. And honestly, I like it that way because when Washington is projected high, that they generally do poorly. And so if they're looked at poorly, it's motivation to get back to it. We had a lot of injuries last season. We're getting guys back healthy, and this is a really well-built unit right now. Let them pick 30th. It's going to be funny in a couple months. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like you said, I don't really care about the power rank, especially when it's, what is it, May 4th today? Like the, the draft just happened. They haven't put on the pad. They haven't even put on the pads yet. So, like, I don't really care about the, the rankings or where they put Washington at. Like you said, are you surprised? No. Have they given you any reason over the past X amount of seasons to, like, say, hey, they should be ranked in the top 15, 20? You could say yes because of the defense and the weapons, but it all comes down to the quarterback. Yep. Like Scott said, they wanted us to they wanted us to trade for Lamar Jackson. They wanted us to draft a quarterback. We passed on Will Levis, so that made a lot of draft people kind of scratch their heads. We took Emmanuel Forbes over Christian Gonzalez. That made people scratch their heads. But at the end of the day, it's just the national talking heads don't really know the inner workings of Washington because – for the most part, we've been almost kind of irrelevant as far as the national as national scheme goes. I saw it was like on the field, you know what I'm saying? Like it's always off the field stuff when they talk about Washington. So you know what? But I'm like they've never. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but <laughs> so at the end of the day, like, look, they have the Atlanta Falcons ranked like 23 or 28, whatever it might be. 20, I don't know, 20 something. They have the same exact questions as us. So like, and we have a better weapons than them. And we have a better defense than them. The only difference is now they got B. John Robinson, a uh, name, an uh, offensive name, a big offensive name. So that's going to be like, oh, they got a new shiny toy to go with Arthur Smith's run game. So at the end of the day, like, like I said, Washington didn't really – it's an offensive league. They didn't really add any toys or special shiny objects from the draft to their offense. So it's going to make people say, oh, well, Ron Rivera's just stuck in his ways of being a defensive coach and offense wins in this league. End of the day – the biggest upgrade we got this offseason was Eric Bieniemy for our offense. Wow. That's what we needed. If Sam Howell can be consistent, I guarantee by week seven, eight, if Sam Howell is average at best, we'll jump up from 30 to like 16 or 14, and people can, I guess, say good job or something. I don't know. It's just power rankings. Who cares? Look, man, this is a team that walked into Philadelphia on Monday night football and yeah. handed them their first loss of the season. And you're going to tell me that – even with all of the changes happened since then, all the injuries, that they're still 30th. I mean, I, I laugh at it. You know, any given Sunday, show up in our field. We're, we're going to – They got the we're Colts. punch you in the mouth. Let's go. Colts at 16, like, was it? Yeah, 16, it's like they got, they got the, the Colts, Colts at 16, and people are talking oh. about oh. – They have more questions at quarterback than we do because they have Anthony Richardson. So, it's like, and I that, mean, I understand Shane Steichen. horrible. Yeah, I understand Steichen. Uh, 
he designed that offense for Jalen Hurts. So, like, the potential is there, but, like, the potential is also there with Eric Benny with Sam Howe. So, it's like, again, it's just a national disrespect of Washington. It go, it's year in, year out. Until we actually become a consistent playoff, like, winning team or a double-digit winning team, because we haven't done that in 10 years at this point, they're never going to actually respect us in the offseason. So, it is what it is. Yeah. And, look, man, it's always going to happen. It, it's – Especially with these media people, right? They're very smart in the way that they do their lists. They some do it like uh, genuinely. They just put out their list. Say, hey, this is what I think, and people have a problem with it, whatever have you. But some people with the big major media markets, the ones that have a lot of click bait and possible people clicking on those, they're going to either size them or they're going to disrespect them in order to gain as much interaction as possible. Those middle market teams are always going to be more so the middle in these sort of rankings just because of that wow aspect of it. So we can't be surprised, man. Let, let them make their lists. Let them talk that talk. We know this team. We know what Eric bien brings to this offense. We know what this team has needed and what Eric bien brings. We know about the offense and the ability that they have with the skill positions already, building up that O-line, and then the defense adding two playmakers. We know the truth, boys. Just let time tell it for us we no reason for us to get angry over it last question scott from tim towner discord question who is all who will be released and what free agent addition will we pick up oh really interesting on this released oh very tough i mean there's five that you could look at the cut straight away for money and it's going to be around cap savings so potentially you could restructure logan thomas or cut him don't see that happening Chase really, unfortunately, I think he's elsewhere um, come the season. A lot of money, probably a first uh, post-June first cut just because of the amount of money you can yeah. save there. Kendall Fuller, another potential one. Do you go younger at the position again um, or do you keep him in for a veteran? Again, anyone who's really high paid on our, on our staff. Norwell, definitely gone um, for me. Never been spoke about for the past three times when they've talked about the competition at left guard. And then I'm struggling thereafter, really. Um, I think, but they're the four that I would stick out. Free agent wise, I'd like to see. Pay, would you pick up a linebacker? We don't really play with three linebackers as fans. We want to see three linebackers on the field, but that Buffalo nickel or the nickel is where we're where we're playing. That's our preferred package. So maybe not there. Patrick Queen hasn't had his fifth year option picked up. Possible pick up there. I don't know. I don't even know if they do anything in the third wave of free agent. Let's see. Yeah, based on what John Kime had talked about in his episode that OG let me in on, um, I don't think Chase Rouye is going to be back. I'm not sure the circumstances, if he'll be traded, whatever have you. Um, but it seems like both parties kind of know what's going on. And I think it was pretty evident by Stromberg being drafted and Gates being brought here. I think that kind of was evident enough in itself. But I respect Chase Rouye because I know what he could do on the field. Big question is, does he garner anything in a trade market? And I, I find that very hard to believe that there is a team out there that needs a center that badly starting that would be willing to trade something, maybe something next year or something like that. Um, Tim, I already answered you in the Discord with this. <laughs> I, I'm not going to talk about a free agent, but I will say we should trade for Jackson Carmen. I'm going to say it again. One more time. We should trade for Jackson Carmen. All right. He's your boy. He love him, don't you? You really do. He's going to die on that hill. He keeps getting but, disrespected. He's just sitting there cheap. I mean, come on. Yeah. He keeps getting disrespected by the team that drafted him, so that should tell you something. But um, He balled out in the playoffs. Yeah. 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 Dead clocks right twice a day. Um, <laughs> in a very now, important um, time of day. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically, like you just said, John Kine pretty much already laid it out there that Chase Rouye is uh, going to be the first on the pretty much the first on the chopping block. From there, there's always a, a surprise cut every year that everyone is kind of like, "Whoa!" So honestly, I don't even really know who that would be off the top of my head, just because all the guys that I, I was kind of thinking that, but they still need like a, like a swing tackle. So yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah, so they do think Braden. Yeah, I could definitely can start out at tackle. He could possibly be your swing tackle. Yeah. So that is the big question with Lucas. You're right, home. Right. Yeah. So Chase Rouye off the top of my head. Um, there'll probably be some like bottom of the roster guys that get cut to create a little bit more space. But I think the big name guy that everyone's going to be uh, looking out for and like knows is coming is Chase Rouye. And as far as adding someone, I do think that. Uh, obviously post-draft teams cut guys like post-June 1st and whatnot. That's how they stumbled upon Charles Leno a couple years ago. 
He was coming and still starts for them to this day. I'm expecting maybe if the uh, left guard position doesn't really play out like they're expecting it to as far as competition-wise, I could see them maybe uh, signing a, a guy off the scrap heap for a left guard position to come in and compete, like a veteran guy. So, like I said, just kind of like the Charles Leno to the left tackle when the Bears cut him a couple years back. So, yeah, that's my answer. I got you. It's a good one, man. It really is. And I do think that Logan Thomas will restructure his deal. I said it way before in the offseason. I did not expect him to be released. If anything were to happen, I would expect a contract restructure. I think both parties are very vested in making sure that happens. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap us up for this episode. Andy, I can't thank you enough. For, Andy Scott, I can't thank you enough for joining. It's been a long day, okay, Scott. We both look the, we both look the same, but I can't be as good looking as Andy. So you know what I mean? It's one of those things, isn't it? It's true. It's just because you don't get as much sleep as Andy. He gets his beauty sleep. You know, you're a hard worker. Andy isn't. You know how it is. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> just kidding. But r- r- right before you go, if you could just let people know where they could find you and the One Point Safety Show, just in case they want to yeah. come follow you. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Hall, for having me on. Um, yeah, we are uh, the One Point Safety Show. We are at One Point Safety Four on Twitter. Um, you can catch my co-host Scouse Andy, who is at Scouse Andy Twenty, and I'm Scotty H Eighty Four, all on Twitter. And our podcast is available on every podcast app that you can find. So um, we drop probably an hour after you guys do. Generally, it's in your feed for a Friday morning, and we let you guys have the spotlight because you deserve it because we we know you're the goats. So. Dude, no, man, yeah. you, guys, you guys uploading, you're going to be stepping on our toes, man. It's got me scared now, Scott. Got me scared. <laughs> not at all. Not hey, at dude, all. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. Keep doing what you're doing. I know it's hard, but keep going. You guys are doing a really, really good job. Just maintain and be consistent. That's all. Best advice I could tell you, um, Scott. All right, everybody. I'm Jackson Carmen. <laughs> I'm whole. I'm a better looking Mike Reed. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. We're gonna I'm gonna play that for him. That's fantastic, Scott. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you made it this far, you are a champion. I can't thank you enough. May the fourth be with you. Enjoy your weekend. Have a great one. We'll see you guys again on Monday. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched TheBurgundyZone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Hey!